Okay. All right. All right. Um, thank you, everyone, for taking the time to join the call today. Uh, really appreciate uh, the audience to you know take time out of their busy schedules to come and you know hear us talk about uh, Microsoft's new offering on Windows desktop infrastructure, which is Windows Virtual Desktop. Uh, my name is Abid Syed. Uh, I'm in the Azure Practice Lead uh, for Canvay Consulting. Uh, you know, my LinkedIn page profile is right there, so I'll be happy to connect with each and every one of you. I'm always connecting with our customers, partners, so, you know, love to interact and you know, build relationships. Uh, so, you know, please do definitely find me on LinkedIn, you know, send me an invite, I'd be happy to accept and, you know, and forge our relationships going forward. Um, this is the agenda for today, uh, so we'll spend maybe five minutes so just kind of doing speaker introductions, uh, in which I kind of already did, and I'll talk a little bit about Canby Consulting, you know, who we are, what do we do, uh, and we'll kind of dive right in into, you know, how virtualization is bringing value to the enterprise, right? So it doesn't matter if you're a big Fortune 500 company or a small medium corporate business, uh, and regardless of the vertical you're in, uh, especially with the times that we live in with COVID-19 and what's happening, I think all of us are fully aware as to how virtualization has become a really a compelling you know, indicator of how we kind of move our enterprise forward, right? Uh, I'll also spend some time, maybe five, five, ten minutes, talking about the Microsoft offering on BDI and how it's different from uh, the traditional ones that you're probably used to, you know, owning or even having already deployed in your environment, like from Citrix or VMware. Uh, and how Microsoft has really lowered the barrier to entry for uh, their BDI offering, which is Windows Virtual Desktop and how that architecture and licensing differs from uh, some of the traditional RDS platforms you're used to, you know, knowing about in the last 10, 15, 20 years uh, and spending a lot of time and money to get those installed, right? I'll also do like a 10, 15 minute demo. Uh, it's going to be a brief demo, uh, but it kind of is going to show you the administrative and user experience that your staff will have, you know, if you were to migrate your existing workloads uh, into WBD, right? Uh, so, and again, if you want to have like a more detailed demo, you know, we'll talk about at the end of the call, um, you know, how we, um, you know, we can definitely spend some more time with you, get to know you, you know, look at your existing requirements in terms of, of you know, BDI, uh, what you're trying to do, where you want to go, uh, and we can, you know, definitely have those one-on-one -on -one, uh, follow-up sessions with you and maybe even do a POC if you're interested. And we'll finally wrap up the call, uh, kind of, you know, kind of just in the leveraging, uh, kind of feeding off of that demo I'm going to show you on how, you know, Microsoft Windows Virtual Desktop offering is simplifying deployment management and security across all those different control planes and how you're going to reap a lot of cost benefits and discounts. And you can also look at uh, some partner options that you can leverage if you decide to go with Canby Consulting as a digital partner of record, right? So let's get started. Um, so Canby Consulting has been, you know, in the industry for over 10 plus years. You know, we are a gold Microsoft managed solutions and services partner. Uh, Canby Consulting is actually part of a larger group of Canby Digital, so it's not just consulting services that we offer under Canby Consulting, uh, but the, the Canby Digital bigger, larger group also has other uh, subcomponents and divisions uh, where we offer other digital services, you know, workforce augmentation. Uh, we also have an engineering wing and healthcare solutions we provide uh, besides customer experience solutions, and of course, work from home solutions, which are kind of, you know, uh, you know, WVD being one of these examples of a work from home solution is under that category, right? Uh, you know, we've been consecutively rated really well on the Inc. 500, the private fastest growing companies. Uh, so definitely, you know, check us out there. Uh, but uh, again, just to kind of emphasize that we are a Microsoft managed services and solutions partner. Uh, so we are here to help you, uh, you know, with your and act as your fully managed IT services firm, if you would allow us to do. So uh, it, in the Canby Consulting uh, wing, you know, we have kind of like three key cloud service areas that we focus on uh, in partnership with Microsoft, right? So as I already mentioned, I'm the practice lead for the Azure practice within Canby Consulting, but I also have my peers, Gary Kurz and uh, Akhil Haider, who kind of lead the Dynamics 365 and Modern Workplace offerings. So if you guys have any requirements in those areas, again, you know, feel free to talk to us. Uh, in the thread uh, with Alan, uh, and we can definitely you know, line you up with them as well uh, and look at those any kind of requirements you may have in those areas. Uh, we're happy to address those uh, with you. So let's dive right in. Uh, let's talk about how virtualization can address a larger, you know, many of your business needs that you have. So again, regardless of which vertical you're in, I'm sure many of you are, you know, probably in different verticals coming from maybe financial services or healthcare or even government, where sometimes you may have certain specific regulatory requirements or compliance requirements that you may have to deal with. Uh, and, you know, that could kind of 
help you decide that you know whether we should host a WVD session in the Azure commercial cloud, which is the typical public cloud most people are aware of. But I think many might not even know that there's something called an Azure government cloud, which also exists. Uh, so uh, for many of the government customers, uh, you know, it could be a requirement where you want to host that WVD solution in, let's say, the Azure government cloud, right? And we're working towards getting ourselves embedded in those kind of capabilities where if you have a requirement in that specific area, we can definitely try to address it for you. It's also a great capability uh, in terms of a flexible workforce. Again, I mentioned the COVID-19 context. I mean, you know, cases are going up, you know, safety is priority. Uh, we want your employees to be, you know, say teleworking, working from home, uh, and even uh, even applies to short term you know, contractors or other employees who instead of you know, sending them laptops and you know going through that capex type uh, spend structure, you have the capability to get contractors to simply spin up, uh, you know, have a VDA instance spun up in the Azure cloud for them. Uh, and when they are done with their work for a week, two week, or in a couple of months stint, uh, you can simply decommission those VDA instances and they're gone, right? So you kind of go with an OPEX based model rather than having a CAPEX based model where you're you know, procuring assets, you know, putting them in your uh, on premise uh, data centers or co location facilities. And then when those short term employees or others are gone, you know, you're still kind of left holding that uh, that asset, which is simply, you know, bleeding money uh, without any return on investment, right? So why do that? You may also have uh, you know call center workforce who are maybe you know working in offshore centers in Asia or EMEA. Uh, and even for them, you may have specific times uh, during the day if you're following a follow the sun model where you know you're only having peak hours during a certain period of the day and then the rest of the day uh, or night, uh, you know, those workforce or desktops are not really being used by your call center workforce. So why have this running? You can, with the um, Microsoft's VDI offering, Windows Virtual Desktop, you have the ability to scale up, scale down uh, those uh, instances that you create in the Azure cloud. And you can even kind of, you know, automate some of those tasks when, they, when your call center workers sign off or something, you can simply shut down those VMs. Uh, and then when they're back in the morning, you turn them back off, right? So there's a lot of flexibility there with this offering. And, you know, we'll kind of show you as we go into the next slides uh, what that's all about. And then you may have uh, specialized workloads. Uh, so, for instance, you may have you know specific power users on staff uh, who are using you know uh, maybe their you know twenty thirty thousand dollar workstations for designing I don't know utilities or doing some engineering drawings or using AutoCAD or something like that or using an you know, ArcGIS as a GIS application which is very resource intensive. So again, instead of spending you know twenty thirty thousand dollars and for one workstation and putting there on their desk when they use it for two hours a day. Again, that's capex that is, you know, you are not able to recollect on it, right? So, again, uh, Microsoft has provided SKUs in Azure where you can not just set up like the typical VMs, which are like a A series or B series, you know, regular use VMs, uh, but you can even have like N series or G series uh, type VMs where, you know, and you can have specialized GPUs on those VMs where you can use them uh, for these kind of power users uh, on an hourly pay as you go model. And when they're done, when they're done, you know those uh, desktops instances can simply be shut down, right? So again, huge cost savings can be had, and again, that kind of reemphasizes the point that virtualization is here to stay, and it's and provides compelling value uh, for your business needs. So again, you know, reemphasizing what I just said, right? Uh, typical, uh, most companies what they do is, you know, they're kind of here, right? You have an on-prem uh, set of assets, you have on-prem VDI probably already today from Citrix or VMware or some other vendor. Uh, you know, you spent you know weeks or months, you know, setting it up over the last few years. But this is what happens typically in the retail industry, for instance. You know, you may have uh, now Christmas is coming up shortly, right? So usage is going to peak up uh, for. Uh, you know, purchases online from a retail uh, company like, you know, TJ Maxx or Best Buy or whoever. So what most companies do is they kind of size their capacity for that off peak, uh, you know, off seasonal peak that was happen because there's no other way to address it because if they didn't have that capacity, they just won't be able to serve their customers properly, right? So what ends up happening is most companies over provision their capacity rather than under provision it just to be on the safe side. But then everything that you see on top of this white line is capacity that for the rest of the year just gets un goes unused. You know, you're not leveraging it at all. Uh, so you spend all this capex and it's not being you know uh, properly utilized, right? With the cloud, uh, it's an opex based model, and as I already said, you have the ability to kind of scale up or down your capacity. That's why it shows it as a dotted line, which you can kind of move it up and down, uh, you know, vertically around the y axis. So it kind of almost closely follows your usage. 
And in the case there's Christmas coming up and a retail, uh, you know, a customer like yourself in the retail industry maybe has an you know, off seasonal peak during Christmas uh, holiday, you know, buying spree, your VMs or desktop instance can be scaled, uh, you know, to to match that uh, that usage requirement, right? And again, once that season is over, you can kind of scale that down again. So again, you're kind of trying to, you know, meter and leverage your spend as much as possible on the assets that you're provisioning uh, with your for your uh, business's requirements, right? So again, the idea being, you know, move from a capex based model to an opex based model, uh, which is definitely a more cost optimized infrastructure. Uh, and will we'll give you much better return on your investment. Okay. And this is typical uh, the 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 way it looks like today, right? In virtualization hosts that we have, um, you know, you may have a traditional RDS infrastructure provides a Windows Server type experience. Uh, it provides multiple sessions, but there may be some deficiencies where you may not be able to run, you know, universal Windows platform applications or newer apps on it. Uh, and it's it's known, right? I mean, you may see users kind of jumping onto the RDS server, and then they're so you know, can't see their favors, they can't see their wallpaper, they can't see their personal you know experience. So they end up you know kind of using it as a jump box to get to their office desktop, which is sitting in their office, just so they can get that same experience. Right? It happens all the time. And you may be limited to using some sort of Office 2019 per perpetual license on those RDS servers uh, because the limitation Microsoft itself has put. Uh, but then on the flip side, you have Windows 10 Enterprise, but it's a native single session. So you only have one user per one desktop mapping. Sure, you can use Office 365, which are newer applications, uh, but then you don't get that multi-session um, requirement that you have. So you can kind of, you know, meter your costs appropriately and be able to, you know, have multiple users leverage your RDS infrastructure as much as possible, right? So what Microsoft has done has introduced a Windows 10 Enterprise Desktop Multi-Session OS. Again, this is very specific to Microsoft. Microsoft does not sell this outside. It's only available in Azure. Uh, so what they've done is they've kind of taken the looked at the deficiencies on the traditional RDS side of things, looked at the deficiencies on the Windows 10, you know, native single session desktop experience, and they tried to kind of bring best of both worlds into this a new OS that they have, which was launched again in fall 2019 of last year as a, as a WBD first release. But then with the spring 2020 update that happened earlier this year, about six months ago, it's right in the middle of COVID. Um, you know, this it kind of provides that the version two update has definitely, uh, you know, taken a, a better look because it can now be integrated into Azure under the ARM uh, framework that you might be familiar with. So if you're running, let's say your virtual machines or your storage, et cetera, many of those have moved in Azure from a classic model to an ARM based template model. So the version 2 spring 2020 update that got released six months ago uh, follows that uh, new ARM based template, which was not available in the initial version WBD release that happened last year, right? So again, the key thing is you're getting a the tradition, the, the typical Windows 10 enterprise desktop experience that, you know, your users, you know, love and use. Uh, you can get multiple sessions, so you can have multiple sessions of users on that same uh, desktop VM in the in the cloud. And you can also leverage your you know, the latest and greatest universal Windows platform apps, as well as your Office 365 licenses, which you may already be using, you know, if you're using SharePoint Online or Exchange Online, Teams, et cetera. Anyway. And again, just want to mention that our team is also in the chat. Uh, so you know, if you guys have any questions, please feel free to just you know, type them in the chat as we go along here. Uh, you know, our, our subject matter experts are on standby. So if you have any questions, because we have so much material to cover, but they'll be happy to answer your questions. So if you have any, just type them in the chat window. So again, um, the key idea here being is that with virtualization and with Microsoft Windows Virtual Desktop offering, you're gaining in multiple fronts, right? Uh, you have infrastructure cost savings because you're moving from that traditional RDX on-prem CapEx-based model uh, to an OPEX-based model in the cloud. So, you know, anywhere we've seen working with customers, 60, 70% savings, which is huge. Uh, even in terms of licensing, uh, uh, Microsoft has provided this flexibility so that WBD is adopted uh, by a lot of customers, especially because they're competing against other vendors like Citrix and VMware out there, and have made it a low barrier to entry by providing a lot of concession on the licensing. So a lot of your RDS, CAD licenses, et cetera, and kind of be brought over uh, onto the WBD environment uh, and their different licensing schemes, uh, which we'll kind of see a brief about in the next few slides, which can again help you save a lot uh, by bringing those licenses onto uh, WBD in the cloud. And last but not least, uh, you definitely save a lot of labor costs uh, because, and I'll show you an example of this, is because a lot of that 
traditional upfront effort that goes into you know provisioning not just your desktop endpoints but your brokering architecture your ingress gateways uh, you know your diagnostic dashboards and all of that a lot of that time that with the on-prem bds solution you know to end up taking weeks or months uh, well, maybe not months but still takes a lot of days and weeks to get it get up and running uh, it can be done fairly easily uh, with windows virtual desktop at a much lesser you know amount of effort required right definitely something worth looking at across all three fronts now so let's look at uh, the next uh, topic here which will kind of evaluate the wbd architecture and how it's different uh, from the traditional vdi solutions you're used to seeing, right? So in the traditional uh, sense, what will happen is you'll see a client, uh, right? You might be having clients who are running uh, Windows desktops or, or, you know, you're trying to use HTML browsers. Uh, I'm sure, you know, VMware sort of provide these too. Uh, but what's, what Microsoft has done is kind of taken away this huge big chunk in the middle, uh, which typically would get deployed as part of your on-prem VDI solution, right? Uh, you would uh, need like a web access, uh, you know, capability, some sort of proxy, you need like an ingress gateway, you need some sort of broker orchestration that kind of, you know, brokers the, the sessions from the, your client side to your server side of things. And you may need like a database in the back end to hold some data. Uh, so a lot of this stuff, you know, in the old days, you would have to manage it by yourself or have someone else manage it for you, right? So the, the great thing with WVD is that Microsoft has taken up this responsibility. And they're saying, hey, you know what, let us manage all this headache and this overhead. So we're going to, and this is kind of invisible, even when you set up Microsoft Windows Virtual Desktop, you don't really see this because it's running in the back end. And Microsoft has completely made it, uh, you know, implicit in the back end. So all you have to really work, uh, worry about as customers and, and as part, you know, working with us as partners is just focus on your clients, what kind of different user experiences you want to have. So whether they're Windows Desktop clients or you want to have them use an HTML5 browser if they're working from home on their personal desktops. Or if they have iPads at their remote and they're walking around, then you can even, you know, connect to a WBD session using their iPad running on iOS, or you know, maybe an uh, maybe a phone that's running Android. Again, I don't know why you would want to run WBD from an Android phone, which would be probably not the best experience you may have. But again, the capability exists. So if you have people who have you know Android phones and they need to log into a WBD session to use Mini Word or something like that, the capability is provided by Microsoft as part of the new WBD solution, right? And in the back end, the only thing you really need to worry about working with us is how we can help you set up those desktop host pools in the background, uh, the application that you want running on those host pools, and you can create different ones. And I'm going to show you that in the demo. Uh, you may have uh, Office 65 applications which keep, which come bundled with that Windows 10 Enterprise multi-session uh, images that are available in the gallery by Microsoft. So you can use those bundled together. You can even add uh, in the layers and overlay your own line of business applications on top of that uh, Windows uh, 10 multi-session holds that you're setting up in the cloud, right? And you can even also use third-party applications. So uh, regardless of whether they're running on legacy servers on-premise, uh, which you can connect to again through, you know, like a side-to-side -side VPN or an express route connection. Uh, and you can also, you know, use uh, SaaS-based services that may be just available uh, as part of their image. You can have them favorited into those sessions. Uh, and so there's a lot of flexibility for you to set up those pools and application groups for your users. And you can categorize them by department if you want, like, you know, you may want a set of host pools for IT, for procurement, for marketing, and so on and so forth. And each set of those users may be getting a different experience and different SKUs of, uh, you know, backend resources that are more akin to what they're trying to do on a day-to-day -day basis, right? You can also use your actual Azure Active Directory, which may be tied in with your on-prem domain controllers. So a lot of that, uh, you know, existing identity and security controls are, you know, kind of trickle down from from the Azure Active Directory. So you don't have to create guest users, give special access to someone, uh, like you know, contractors or uh, you know, short-term employees. But a lot of that group policy and other things can automatically be kind of leveraged from that Azure Active Directory synchronization with your on-prem uh, domain controllers uh, or indoor forests, right? And last but not least, uh, Microsoft acquired a company called FS Logix in the last couple of years. So what FS Logix pioneered was, you know, when you have users logging in from different endpoints, whether they're logging in from their Windows 10 uh, or Windows 7 client desktops or HTML5, sometimes those experiences would be different, right? They might not see their wallpaper they love, or they might not be able to get to their favorites. So what FS Logix pioneered is, is kind of like a cloud persistent user um, user profile. 
so this was so popular that you know Microsoft ended up just acquiring by FS Logics, and, and this technology has now been incorporated into Windows Virtual Desktop. Uh, so again, the idea is rather than having uh, you know these kind of profiles dispersed on file servers somewhere and they're kind of getting all kinds of issues uh, trying to pull those that data. Uh, this uh, the user profiles are you know kind of cloud persistent and they kind of float in the cloud you know like a blob storage uh, in Azure in your own subscription. Uh, and regardless of you know which endpoint the customer the user your user or employee is logging in from, they get that same consistent experience regardless of that endpoint, right? So that's the key the key thing right there to to understand. So that's the key architecture. And, and again, as I said, uh, one of the biggest things to take away here is that Microsoft has taken over responsibility for a lot of this broker architecture and orchestration architecture. So you don't have to build it, we don't have to build it, and we can simply focus on you know getting it up and running quickly with the different uh, bring your own devices uh, capability uh, and helping you you know host those pools and applications and AD synchronizations and, and cloud persistent profiles. Uh, and we have a cases where we work with customers in, in even basic 25 to 30 or 40, 50 users. We've been able to get them up and running through a proof of concept in, you know, in one to two weeks or less. So again, you know, you don't want to be that guy who's kind of, you know, working with those traditional uh, web access gateway broker architecture, uh, you know, in the from the on-prem virtualization days, right? If you move to WVD, the, the key thing is a lot of those licensing and other managed services capability is, is available in one single dashboard, and you'll see that uh, you know, in a few minutes. So you don't have to have different control planes for different components of the architecture, but rather just have one central in a single pane of glass uh, managed service uh, to, that you can use to manage your infrastructure, your licensing, your application groups, and your users all in one place, right? So it's really, uh, that's kind of the key takeaways here. And for whatever reason, and then maybe you don't want to, you know, kind of tinker with WVD at the moment, uh, but just be aware that if you're using Windows RDS already, the traditional services, uh, you know, you have the capability to even bring those Windows RDS servers into the cloud. So rather than keeping them on premise, and this is what I was mentioning earlier, is you get some concessions from Microsoft. And you don't have to, again, have that RDS license, uh, you know, that you're spending on kind of goes away when if you were just simply lift and shift your RDS servers running on 2012 R2 or above or what have you. Uh, and, you know, you can pretty much go from, um, you know, spending maybe $600, uh, you know, per uh, per VM for about a thousand compute hours as an example, uh, to go into to saving about two thirds of that cost to maybe a Windows Server VM in WVD, right? So it's almost like low Linux rates really uh, and spending about only a third of what you would be typically spending per RDS server. Right. So something to think about. And once you do that, then that could be like a phased approach to doing that lift and shift first and then, you know, kind of migrating into a, a fully cloud based Windows virtual uh, Windows virtual desktop architecture. Uh, and you've seen, you know, both things happen. You know, customers do the lift and shift of their RDS infrastructure first, so at least they can get these cost savings going. And in some cases, we've seen customers say, you know what, we don't really need RDS anymore. WVD is pretty awesome. Let's just, you know, host it in the cloud, get it up and running. And they, you know, move their users to use the new platform and simply decommission the old platform. So that's we see in both cases. And and I'm sure all of you have heard about Windows 7, Windows Server 2008 R2, you know, kind of going going out of you know end of support early this year in January. Uh, so again, we, we highly highly recommend you start kind of moving towards the new platforms. Now there may be cases where you know you're using Windows 7 for whatever reason. You may have some legacy application which was built five, eight, eight, ten years ago. And it has a dependency on Windows 7, and it's fine. You know, you can still host, uh, have your users, you know, have that native single session on there and use it. Uh, but you know, if you can bring Windows 7 to the cloud to Azure, uh, one of the things I will talk about in the next slide is uh, you can again save on their extended security updates that you may be paying out of pocket. Right. Uh, same goes for Windows Server 2008 R2 as well. You know, you have the capability to migrate that platform into Azure. You can still keep it on 2008 R2 again for that maybe same reason. That you may have a legacy application that is, you know, running on it, uh, that you can't really, you know, refactor or rebuild for another two years or three years. Then why not bring that 2008 R2 into the cloud? Because Microsoft is going to give you uh, extended security updates for three years for free at no cost. So definitely, you know, think about those along those lines as you're thinking about Windows Virtual Desktop and VDI. Uh, these questions do come up, so it's really important to pay attention to these because you may be spending money that you don't really need to. And you can instead reroute to you know your core business uh, you know uh, requirements. 
So that was for the server side. On the client side, it's it's a very simple equation, right? I mean, you have, as we said, typically you have you know one user using one one desktop uh, from the client point of view. Again, you know each VM or each desktop may be a single session personal desktop experience, and you, you know it's uh, underutilized. You maybe only maybe twenty or thirty percent of the VM is or, or desktop is being used at any given time. But if you were to kind of move that into like one host VM. In, in Azure, you can see that you can have multiple people connect through multiple sessions into that one VM host. So again, you're kind of leveraging in you know, a cost economies here, right? So instead of spending, let's say $40 per user per month, uh, you know, for one, let's say a D2, V3 type Windows 10, uh, 10 VM, uh, you know, you could actually potentially get even more users on a beefier VM. Uh, and you know, kind of reduce that cost per user per month, right? And I'll show you a really quick example. You don't, you may even not need to go to like a D8 series. So if I kind of show you a really quick example here. So if, if you look at this uh, recommendations from Microsoft itself, so we were looking at a D2 V3 machine, right? So if you were to host just one D2 V3 machine on the cloud, uh, you can see that Microsoft's recommendation, even for a light user, like your typical office productivity user, you can have six users, uh, you know, on uh, across these uh, per virtual CPU. So you can have 12 users log into that one D2 V3 box, right? So it's like 12 multiple sessions on that D2 S V3 VM in the back end, which is hosting your Windows 10, you know, enterprise multi-session experience, right? Even if I was to say, you know what, I want even half of those users to have the best experience they can. So even if I was to kind of go and say, you know what, I'm going to just put one D2 V3 in the cloud, uh, in the in Windows Virtual Desktop uh, environment, and even if it was to use only six users times seven, that's forty two dollars. So you're spending about the same amount of money. Where on that single session, you're spending forty dollars per user per month, while for that about that same amount of price, you could actually host six users. In fact, actually twelve. But you know, I'm trying to be lenient here, I'm, and I can give six of my users the best experience they've had uh, in a multi-session Windows 10 experience on that same kind of box in the cloud, right? So a huge savings. You're looking at seventy to eighty-five percent savings, uh, which uh, again, you know, it's 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 just it's just so simple math to to do and and realize that uh, again, this is what I was saying earlier. Is Microsoft really made it a low barrier entry to make it a serious proposition uh, to definitely take a second look. And again, as I mentioned, RDS licensing also gets consolidated quite a bit. Uh, so if you're using, you know, uh, when you're migrating Windows Server RDS from on-prem to a Windows 10 Enterprise multi-session uh, WVD environment, uh, we've typically seen about, you know, about 15 to 17 dollars in savings per user per month, right? So again, I'm not a licensing expert by any means, but we have Stacy on here as well, who's our licensing expert. So we'd definitely be, you know, love to have those follow-up sessions with you where we can look at, you know, what your requirement has, what kind of licensing you have, and try to map it uh, to, you know, what that would entail in the new Microsoft Windows Virtual Desktop uh, environment. And this is important to see. This is a really important slide because um, if, I'm sure many of you probably already have some sort of, you know, M365 EMS type licensing. So if you're using E3, E5, because you have, you know, SharePoint online already, you have Exchange online, uh, or if you're, you know, using Microsoft 365, um, you don't need to spend an, an extra penny to get Windows Virtual Desktop up and running, at least from the client side of things. So you already have the licensing for WVD and it's covered. That's the key point here, right? So if you have any of these licensing already in place, uh, then you don't have to spend any additional licensing for Windows Virtual Desktop. And on the server side, if you have software assurance, you can definitely leverage some of that uh, on the server side as well. And there's some uh, some cost savings to have it. Uh, with, transitioning RDS CAL licenses uh, into the WBD context. And last but not least, this is what I was going to talk about is that for whatever reason, if you still have Windows 7, you can see how cost prohibitive it is uh, for keeping those environments on-prem, right? You could be spending, regardless, depending on you know which license you have, it is Windows 7 Enterprise or Pro, uh, you could have anywhere from you know, $25 to $200 you may be spending over the next three years from 2020 starting now to 2022. Uh, when if you were simply go, if you could simply bring that Windows 7 host into the WVD environment in the cloud, you could be looking, looking at savings of about $25 to $200 savings per device per year. That's a, that could be substantial, right? Um, so today, if you're paying for extended security updates on those Windows 7 boxes, you know this is a a good uh, transformation that you can go through 
where if you were to simply bring those hosts into the cloud, Microsoft tells you, hey, you know, you don't have to pay any external security updates at all. And what's even scarier is I've seen customers where they are not even subscribed to external security updates, which is even more dangerous. Uh, we really don't want to see that <laughs> because then you're opening yourself up to, you know, ransomware and all kinds of security and ugly things that are out there. Uh, so if you don't have external security updates, definitely subscribe to them, you know, and you'll be paying for it on-prem. Uh, but the better solution is move your Windows 7 host into WVD in the cloud, uh, and Microsoft will cover those external security updates for you for free for, for the next three years. All right. Let's now uh, dive into a demo. Uh, it's just a 10, 15 minute demo. Um, I think it will kind of you know, help you guys see what the administrative and user experience is going to look like uh, for, your, for your team and for your staff and your employees. If you were to migrate your existing workloads into WVD, right? So let me kind of over here. So when you first come to um, the Azure portal, and I'm sure many of you have already have workloads in Azure, I'm sure, right? You have some sort of hybrid environment working today. Uh, the demo I'm going to show you is actually on the government cloud. Uh, so just to kind of show you that Windows Virtual Desktop actually also went GA in the government cloud. I just I'm just showing this demo in the government cloud just because I have my sandboxes set up here for the time being. Uh, by, but by all means, uh, most of you are probably familiar with portal.azure.com, which is the generic Azure larger cloud commercial cloud that's been out there for for much longer than the government cloud. Um, but the key point is the Windows Virtual Desktop is now an ARM-based template. It's available just like any other of the ARM based offerings you have like virtual machines, uh, app services, SQL databases, storage accounts, et cetera. So with the spring 2020 update that Microsoft came out with six months ago, they released Windows WVD, what we call version two or the spring 2020 update as an ARM based offering, which has made you, know, you being able to leverage a lot of the Azure capabilities uh, on top of uh, WVD a lot, lot easier. When the first version came out in 2019 last year, it was easy to deploy it, but management was a major headache. And I'm sure you guys probably, if you ever piloted it for your uh, company or tested it, it was a nightmare, the, the older version of from last year, because you could deploy it, but then for you to manage it, you would have to use uh, all kinds of, uh, you know, PowerShell scripts and, and whatnot to, to actually manage it. So it was really bad. But with the spring 2020 update, a lot of things are much more, you know, synchronized with the Azure portal. So you can leverage all these capabilities in one single pane of glass. So just like anything else, you can, you know, just like you search for virtual machines or you search for, you know, storage, I can simply type Windows Virtual Desktop and it's going to come up. Uh, in my case, I already had it. I've been using it so often that uh, it shows up as a shortcut. So, you know, that's what Microsoft does. It shows you the most recent uh, of your templates in the uh, shortcuts in the portal. So when I go here, Windows Virtual Desktop, it shows me an overview. You have some good documentation to get started. You can create your own image. You can all do this by yourself. But again, you know, if you're looking for a partner to help you do that, you know, we're here for you. And we can kind of guide you along on how you can create host pools, your application groups and workspaces, and how you can assign users to use those host pools and application groups that you set up uh, for across different departments and all that, you know, synchronized with the Azure Active Directory goodness, uh, connecting with your on-prem domain controllers. So your users' identity, your their access rights, their group policies all kind of trickle through, uh, through that synchronization. So main thing, I'll walk, kind of walk through each of these capabilities. So when you click on host pools, so you know there are basically three main areas in, in Windows Virtual Desktop and the new Spring 2020 update. Uh, so when you go into host pools, you will see host pools are pretty much what they say they are, right? It's a pool of host sessions in the back end. So you can create uh, your own host pools. In this case, I have like you know three or four here. So if I go into the specific uh, host pool, you can see it tells you what resource group it's part of in Azure. And I'm sure many of you who are using Azure already you know you know what a, what a resource group is you know what location it's sitting in and what subscription of yours it's part of right and you will see it says it's a pooled host pool or if it's a, it's a personal host pool right so what's the difference so the pooled host pool means that uh, any users that you or application groups that you associate with this uh, host pool you can have multiple users log into each of the hosts uh, through multiple sessions on in this host pool right if it's a personal Host pool is different. It's a one-to-one -one mapping, and I'll show you that in a second. So let's go into the first one here. So if I go into the desktop host pool, again, it shows you all the information about this pool in a resource group location and all of that. And if I go into session host, it kind of shows me what VMs are in the back end that are kind of hosting this pool. That's what that means, right? It will even show you if there's any active users assigned to it. In this case, it's a it's a pooled host pool. Uh, so it even it will show you how many active sessions are there. There may be one session or three people three people logged into the second box, maybe zero users logged into the third box, and so on. 
So if I click on it, it'll show me, you know, what kind of SKU, uh, and again, SKU is meaning what kind of VM types that Microsoft assigns are, are running uh, running this specific host. So this, you can see this particular host is basically a B2 uh, VM type, right? And it shows you the users who were last logged in or recently have been disconnected. And so nobody's logged in right now, but you have the ability to you know, log off users if you want to, because you want to do some maintenance on a host and there's other things you can do. You can remove it and add a new host uh, to that pool. You can do a bunch of different things uh, that you want to uh, for that. Right? You can create a, um, a high performance host pool if you want to, and you may do this. Why? Because you know maybe you have power users, so you may want to segregate your office users from your power users. So that's why you have a high performance computing host session here. So if I click on it, you can see it's a beefier machine. So you can see it's a B4 versus a B2. So it's a beefier machine. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier in the discussion that if you had, you know, CAD designers or, you know, engineers are designing some crazy solution or using ArcGIS as a, a geo mapping and analytics platform, which is in a very resource intensive, um, you may even be using like an N series VM in the back end. So you could create a host pool and have an N series VM or VMs back it up. So when you're, you know, your next, you know, your Steve or an eco or like engineers and designers are logging in, they have the appropriate resources required to run those resource intensive applications like ArcGIS or AutoCAD or something like that, right? And you can see that I'm connected, connected, you know, I'm right now connected to this specific VM. So you can see that I'm showing up as active. Uh, while other other users who who are part of this application group or host pool are currently disconnected, right? You can create an Office 365 host pool as well. Uh, and again, you can see this one has three machines on it. And if I kind of click on it again, it has a B2, which is again lower than a B4. And obviously, because you know you don't need a much beefier machine to run a, a host pool uh, which has users on it. You know who are like your you know procurement department or your IT department or someone. Who are just doing basic stuff and they don't really need a much uh, you know resource intensive host pool or hosts uh, for their sessions okay. the personal desktop uh, host pool this is different and i'll show you why this is so if i click on this you will see and if i go to session host now you see that there's a one-to-one -one mapping uh, you know and you'll typically and the active session will always be one what that means is that again this is like maybe for your extreme users who who don't want to share their desktop with anybody and we have a few in every organization right so you may have john who's like nope i just want my own personal desktop i'm not going to share it with anybody so in that specific case you would have these personal session hosts right in this case you can see this one is assigned to john this one is assigned to a user called wvd user and if i want to assign this particular host to a specific user i can kind of go in and assign it uh, to whoever i want to search their name and then just add them and this will all trickle in straight from azure ad uh, so you don't don't have to kind of create new guest users or anything like that uh, in your user profile space here. Now let's go to application groups. Um, and if you go into application groups, you will see these are nothing but groups of applications that you can associate to a specific host pool in the back end, right? So by, by default, when you create an application group, there'll be a desktop application group that gets uh, you know associated. It shows you, you know, which set of users are assigned to use these app application groups. And in this particular case, it's a full-blown desktop application group. What that means is that this is a full-blown session desktop, right? So now let me show you what that looks like from the user end. So if I was to go in here and I'm logged in as a user, in this case, I'm logged in and I'm using the HTML5 browser as a client, you can see that I have a, uh, you know, I have, I'm part of like two application workspaces here. And we'll come to workspaces in a second, but you can see all the different applications that I can launch just straight from my browser and also like a full desktop based experience that I can launch as well if I wanted to. So if I go back here, you can see this one is called session desktop. If I click on it, the display name is shared pool, shared pool, right? So that's what shows up over here. When I go, you can see it says shared pool. Now I can I can change this to whatever I want. I can even call this, you know, my desktop if I want to and save it. And if I was to do that, what will happen is next time when your users who are part of this application group were to log in, instead of saying shared pool, it will say my desktop, right? So the HTML5 web browser experience is one way, uh, but I can also kind of go and uh, you know have a remote desktop client. So this again, just be aware that this is not the RDP client that we're used to using, you know, for all these years that Microsoft always had it on Windows. Uh, it sounds very similar, so again, that's Microsoft marketing for you. Uh, but uh, there's the actual desktop client that you can install and run on your user's desktop. So let's say you have a teleworker working from home on their personal desktop. You don't want them, you know, copy pasting things from their personal desktop, which maybe there's viruses on it or whatever. 
you can have this uh, actual RD, uh, remote desktop client, which is specific to WBD, and you can just launch this uh, desktop, uh, you know, straight from that uh, remote client as well, right? So in this case, you see it's, it's connecting, uh, and you can see that just like that, it takes me, it didn't even take a second, and I get that full-blown uh, Windows desktop experience, right? So you can see I can get to my start menu. Uh, I can, you know, I can uh, look at my, I can open up my browser and kind of move it around. So again, full desktop experience. So even if your user has their own personal desktop, uh, they can launch whatever application they want. If they're Office user, they can go and start using Word right away, and they can even use Teams. And uh, again, there's a lot of discussion about USB redirection of their headset and printers and things like that. All that is possible in Windows Virtual Desktop. Uh, and they can get to use it. Uh, there's absolutely no issue. It's almost like sitting right in front of a your own uh, personal desktop experience, um, and it's pretty pretty easy to do, right? They can even minimize it for or max or you know kind of lower lower the window a little bit. They can kind of move it around. So again, it's a full Windows virtual desktop experience, just like sitting in front of their their own personal desktop, uh, and they can just simply launch it either from their this RD remote desktop client for WBD, or they can even launch yeah. it. Uh, from a HTML based web browser as well. Right. And even if you're uh, even if you're like a remote app user, so what that means is that this is the desktop experience. But let's say you have a set of users who are just Office 365 app users. You know, they don't need AutoCAD or they don't need uh, you know anything else. Then you can see that you can just set them up in an application group that just has the typical Office productivity apps, Access, Excel, PowerPoint, and stuff like that. So when that specific user logs in, they will only see Excel or they will only see Outlook and they can simply click on it and it will just only show them that specific application. They will they will not have a full blown desktop experience and that may be because again you want to re, you know maximize your resources appropriately. So why give them a full blown you know desktop experience if they don't need to? It could be an accountant and all he or she does is just use Excel and crunch numbers all day. So you can create uh, those kind of application groups which are remote app application group types. And that will help your users, uh, which are you know in that category, to just only use those specific applications, right? Like Excel and PowerPoint and so on and so forth. Now you may have um, a power user, so you, you know you, you may have like an AutoCAD designer, so they you know they can again launch uh, the AutoCAD application or ArcGIS from their browser, or in this specific case, they're probably going to use their desktop client to to launch that uh, full desktop experience, shared full desktop, right? And they'll be able to see you know, their RGIS application. And again, you can see it's a 3D model that I'm flipping over here. I'm sitting at home over a Wi-Fi connection doing this demo for you, and I can literally see no lag on a B4 machine. So think about how this will work, you know, if you actually had a an N-series VM running in the back end, right? And here's an AutoCAD 3D model, in which I'm kind of flipping back and forth. There's absolutely no lag. Again, over Wi-Fi, you know, sitting at home, and I'm like a 3D designer just you know, kind of flipping this over, right? And you can use, say, even Power BI or anything like that. So any kind of application that you're looking at, uh, you know, it's all possible uh, through Windows Virtual Desktop uh, from multiple endpoint types. HTML5 browser, your uh, full-blown remote desktop client experience that can, you know, you can launch a full desktop experience or even on your iPad or iPhone if you desire to do so. Right. And workspaces is basically what I just showed you. So when I'm logging in, uh, you can kind of have uh, different application groups associated with a specific workspace. And you may do that for a couple of reasons. So I, I, I can see both these application groups because I have a different set of applications that are part of Office 365 here uh, and more you know, powerful applications that are part of the high performance computing application group like the AutoCAD and the um, RGIS application that I was just showing you, right? So if I'm a part of both of these application groups, uh, then you can specifically just give me this application's workspace so that when I log in, I can see all those in just you know that one one area, right? So all those application groups that I have access to will show up in my application workspace. So that's what uh, workspaces are, and that's how they're defined, which is kind of easy way to kind of have the flexibility to associate applications with users, right? So that's what that does. And any kind of user assignment always happens at the application group level. That is important to know. So it's not happening at the host level or the workspaces level. If you want to assign users, you you typically only assign them to the application group. So if you go here, you will see you will have an assignments tab here or blade, and you can then you know, again add users directly one by one. Or um, in most cases, as an organization, you will have an IT department or a marketing department or a contracts department, 
uh, and you can simply add that entire group and just straight straight away that group of users within that Azure AD group or uh, you know will have access to that specific set of applications. So whenever and you can simply you know remove users, add users as you please, and depending on what you do and how you manage it, uh, all again from that once you know one single pane of glass here. Uh, your users will you know, see icons appear and disappear and what applications they will have access to today versus what applications they won't have access to tomorrow. Okay. So hope that makes sense. And again, there's a lot more to it. I mean, you know, I can uh, and again, when you have a follow up session with us, you know, we'll be happy to kind of show you how you can create new host pools, you know, uh, you know how you can send it associated with subscription, how you can pick resource groups. Uh, there's a lot more to it you know, how you how you pick different types of host pools, how you can pick uh, virtual machine types, um, you know, how do you decide on, uh, you know, where you want to place that host pool? Can you open up certain inbound ports or not? Can you domain join those hosts? And so there's a lot more to it. And if you can use, um, you know, breadth first or depth first type um, uh, load balancing. So again, it, it's, 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 it's a lot, right? So, and that's where we come in. We kind of make this easy. And again, we always take an educational approach like we're doing here with you. Uh, and we're always, uh, you know, willing to help you, you know, get this uh, WVD session uh, and solution set up for you in the cloud. Um, and and we can definitely talk about this as we go along. So that's the demo. Let me switch back to the slides. And if there's any questions, again, please continue to kind of post them in the chat window. Uh, our subject matter experts are available to to answer those for you. So now let's look at the the simplified, um, you know, deployment management security controls and what cost benefits you can get. And again, a lot of things I've already talked about. Um, and again, so in the typical traditional virtual, you know, VDI on-prem infrastructure, you have different control planes for your VDI, uh, for your remote apps. Uh, and one thing I'll definitely like to, you know, mention here, which is important, uh, with with WVD uh, under Microsoft, it's all just one control plane, right? You can control your desktops, your remote apps, your hosts, your application groups, your users, all under one single pane of glass, right? So that's really really important to know. And the licensing structure is very very much simplified. One thing that's really key to note is if you guys are evaluating, let's say AWS as a competitor, uh, just remember that uh, AWS actually has two different offerings for this. So they have something called AWS Workspace and they have something called AWS App Service. So, and they're two completely different solutions. Uh, you won't find multi-session on there. Uh, and even the licensing is completely separate and different and the control planes are different, right? So in case you're thinking about AWS, just kind of keep that in mind. Uh, so Microsoft uh, has definitely made things a lot easier uh, with Windows Virtual Desktop. And again, a lot of the tools are readily available. Uh, I just kind of showed you deploying the VMs is easy. You can set up host pools in no time. Uh, you can have the same type of tools that you're used to using in Azure, like Azure Monitor, Azure Security Center, uh, you know, having backup set up for your VMs. All those things that you already know and love about Azure, you can apply those to WVD as well, right? So again, a lot of that, and again, that was a key update that Microsoft did with Spring 2020 release uh, six months ago. They wanted to make sure that all the other capabilities that you have within Azure uh, that you can use, so like Azure Monitor, Security Center, and everything, you can apply those to these workloads in WVD as well, just like you can do that uh, for the other workloads you already have, whether it's a compute resource or it's a storage resource, an application, a database, or whatever the case may be, those same tools uh, within Azure readily apply to WVD as well. And again, simplified management. So any kind of diagnostics issues, again, same thing. Alerts, um, you know, notifications that go out from Azure, um, all those are fully integrated. So if your VM is failing for whatever reason, uh, or there's a problem some, uh, with the disk on a VM or a, or a host in session, uh, then you can have alerts configured uh, just like you would with like Azure Monitor and things like that, and diagnostics being sent out into a blob storage, which where they can be collected and they can be reported on. So again, all the issue management stuff and everything uh, in the on-prem, uh, you know, context. Obviously, you guys are going probably through a lot of different things uh, that you have to look at. This logs that are dispersed across different, you know, brokered architecture and everything like that. All that can be just done in like one log index type workspace, and you can pull those reports uh, just like you would using Azure Monitor or some other uh, dashboard in, in Azure. And one of the key things, which I think I forgot to kind of mention, is that Traditional infrastructures, you know, you had to open up firewalls, you had to open up RDP ports. Uh, one of the coolest things about uh, Windows Virtual Desktop is you don't need any of that. So a lot of the, like, uh, you don't need an ingress gateway, you don't need to open up, uh, you know, 3389 or any kind of ports like that. 
um, the session like I just showed you in the demo, it's all happening over secure HTTP TLS SSL connections. You don't even need a VPN client, you know, so gone are the days where you have to set up your teleworkers with a Juniper, uh, you know, um, router or something like that and or a firewall in there or a Cisco firewall and just because they can have a VPN connection, you don't need it. You don't need a VPN client. You don't need a VPN server in, in the cloud. All so Microsoft has made it really, really simple. It's a reverse connect a proprietary connection that happens from the WVD control plane back to the endpoint. Uh, so everything is happening over a secure HTTP channel using TLS SSL connections, uh, and it's it's totally secure. You don't need to have uh, any kind of additional overhead to to get the connectivity going. And in terms of security, again, because it's all baked into Azure AD, so all those capabilities that you have with multi-factor authentication, conditional access, uh, all those are, are available, including group policies, right? So you can right away start leveraging those. So as we help you kind of connect your on-prem domain controller and synchronize it with the Azure AD in the cloud, uh, you can you know, leverage those capabilities that you're probably already doing uh, for your, you know, VM compute instances or storage and applications that are already, you know, used, already been you know, kind of migrated into the cloud. You can do the same uh, for WVD as well, right? So all the security benefits also, you know, continue to apply. And last but not least, I mean, you know, you would typically in the on-prem VDI instance, you would have a different admin uh, for each um, thing that you want to try to manage. You typically have to end up giving them full admin rights to do anything, something breaks, someone deletes something, and then you're trying to figure out who did what. Um, the great thing about WVD, again, with those AD permissions and role-based access control, you can only give specific owners and operators and contributors the access level they need to do what they need to do, right? So you don't want an operator having full ownership rights, and then you know that person goes, an IT support person goes and blows away something, and then you know uh, in the traditional environment when you have to cry about it, you don't have to do that. You don't have to worry about it here because you can use the AD based role based access control to only give them the uh, the access rights that they need to manage a specific uh, piece of the WBD solution that you're deploying. Right. So again, everything segregated, access rights are segregated, and you only give access rights. So it's all about minimizing uh, the, 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 the leverage on the access control that you need to give to each person who's managing your infrastructure. And again, if you come to us, you know, we do this for you. So we're like the, a fully managed IT service shop. Uh, so we can you know, handle all these things for you. And we've done this for a bunch of customers, as I said. Um, you know, we've had um, a, a recent customer, like a medium corporate, a small medium corporate business. Uh, they were having you know, office app users. Um, and, uh, you know, with, in, in deployed in the East US region, we, we also leverage things like reserved instances, which is possible also with WVD. Uh, so, you know, we went from, let's say, spending, say, $50 per, per user per month um, in, in terms of cost, like single session, to almost, you know, 10% of that, right? So it's, it's, a, it's a really important, you know, cost benefit to look at, which I think a lot of customers are. Um, you know, haven't seen. Uh, so it's, it's definitely something to look at and realize, uh, at least through like a, a fault session or a proof of concept that help you see that if I was to do a proof of concept with 25 users or 30 users or 50 users, what kind of cost benefits are you seeing? And we have seen these uh, for many of our customers. And last but not least, uh, because we are a Microsoft Gold partner, you get to, you know, take advantage of a lot of the benefits that come with, uh, you know, from Microsoft that we typically just kind of end up passing it on to you. So everything from Azure hybrid benefits, if you have software assurance, uh, to any kind of incentive-based programs that are available with Windows Virtual Desktop, and they continue to, you know, be placed by Microsoft and we take advantage of it for our customers. Uh, CSP based margins and rebates, uh, and again, reserve instances I just mentioned. Uh, so a lot of these uh, Microsoft and partner benefits you can leverage uh, for WVD, and we'll be happy to talk to you more about it. If you decide to, you know, kind of have us as your digital partner of record. So again, there's only a couple of minutes left. Uh, so last but not this is the, the last slide here. Um, you know, what we've seen here today is that Microsoft Windows Virtual Desktop uh, is a great virtual service that's virtualization service that's available for you in the cloud. Uh, provides you with a multi-session user experience, so that helps you consolidate a lot of your, you know, capex-based on-prem VDI infrastructure into an opex-based model. Uh, ease of simplified management and deployment um, in, in terms of what I just showed you in the demo. It's very easy to do, and we're, we're here to help you set it up. 
uh, and you can take control of uh, the security uh, that's already available through Azure AD and Active Directory and, and uh, services like Azure Security Center to help you manage your uh, WDD instance once you host it in the cloud, right? It's fully integrated uh, with the, the Microsoft uh, Azure portal, uh, and you also can take benefits uh, from an, um, us being a strong partner in that ecosystem. So again, this is the last slide. Uh, you know, again, don't be this guy, right? <laughs> Obviously, uh, you know, we are happy to connect with you again. So let us know. Uh, reach out to Alan, uh, who's on the call here. I just reply back to the thread of, uh, you know, depending on whoever sent you the invite, uh, we can set up a, you know, one to two hour analysis session with you, which is free at no cost to you. So we get to know you better. We get to see your requirements, uh, what they are, and how we can help you. Uh, and if, if that makes sense, then you know we can definitely have a, a follow-up consulting engagement with you and try to help you with a basic proof of concept. 25, 30, 40, 50, 100, 100 users. Uh, you know, we've done it for other other customers. And even if you're using, uh, like, say, VMware or Citrix today, um, these companies and vendors are partnering with Microsoft, so we can even leverage those control planes and then extend them into WVD. So feel free to talk to us. Uh, and uh, this recording will be available to you. Uh, next week. So, you know, if you have any questions, again, reach out to us uh, and, uh, you know, we'd be happy to uh, be your fully serviced uh, managed service partner uh, moving forward. And that's all I had. Uh, I'm going to pass it back to you, Alan. If you have any, any last words to say? Thank you, Abit, for the informative session. Uh, we will just wait for another couple of minutes to see if someone has any questions. Um, as people are typing in their questions, um, just wanted to update on our future webinar. We have a, a webinar which is an upcoming three part series webinar around the data analysis, uh, around the customer insights for the Dynamic 365 CRM site. This is scheduled for Jan 21st at 1 p.m. Central. Uh, we are going to share um, this webinar invitation with all the folks who have joined the call today. We'll be more than happy to host you for upcoming webinar as well. Just waiting for last minute to see if you have any questions. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat window. And I think this is really great. Thanks everyone for uh, taking out the time and joining the call uh, today. Uh, we will look forward uh, to host you in future webinars as well. Thanks everyone. Thanks everybody. Have a great day.